Hello and welcome to Electromagnetics 1. Dr. Trample here. This is lecture 20. We'll be talking about electromagnetic waves today. Um, before we talk specifically about electromagnetic waves, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, waves in general. Um, a wave is a disturbance that propagates through space over time. So there are an awful lot of phenomena that can be described as waves, whether that's sound waves or uh, <coughs> electromagnetic waves or various other kinds of waves. There's, there's an awful lot of them, um, ocean waves. There's just a lot of different examples of, of waves. Waves are solutions um, to second order partial differential equations called wave equations. All right? So that's one thing to keep in mind about them is that um, waves satisfy uh, wave equations. So we can study them from a mathematical perspective. The one dimensional scalar wave equation looks like this. Um, <clears throat> if E is the quantity of interest here, it depends on uh, position and on time. Um, so you take the second derivative with respect to time here minus the velocity squared, U is the velocity, times the second derivative with respect to the spatial variable, and that's all set equal to zero. Okay. Um, it's a scalar wave equation here because E is a scalar, is simply a scalar quantity. It doesn't have vector components yet. It might be, for instance, one component of a vector, but E is in general a scalar, well, is a scalar, not a vector for the scalar wave equation. And this equation has solutions that propagate in the positive z direction. Um, one of them uh, is, I'm, I'm denoting as e plus here, which is some function of z minus u of t. Um, and it also has solutions that propagate in the negative z direction, denoted here by e minus uh, of z as a function of t, which is f of z plus u of t. Well, why does this solution propagate in um, the positive uh, z direction? It has to do with this argument here. You can think of it in this way. Um, if you're tracking a, a point at a particular z uh, location that starts at a particular z location, as time moves along, in order for this argument to stay the same, z has to increase. In other words, it has to move in the plus z direction. Um, the opposite is true here for e minus. Um, if you're tracking a, a point that starts at an initial position, in order to track that point, in order, in order to keep this um, argument the same, um, as t gets large and positive, u has to, z has to um, increase in the negative direction. It has to get, it has to decrease, in other words. Now, for time harmonic fields, where we introduce in a factor of e to the j omega t for the time dependence, the wave equation may be written like this. e sub s of z, this is our notation for a phasor, essentially, here. And um, uh, when you plug in uh, e to the j omega t for the time dependence, you end up with this equation, second derivative with respect to z plus beta squared times uh, the function itself is equal to zero, where here beta is equal to the frequency omega divided by the velocity u. Okay, the forward and backward propagate, propagating solutions to this time harmonic equation look like this, and here you see the um, time dependence e to the j omega t out front. The um, forward plus z propagating solution looks like this, e to the j, j omega t minus um, beta z. And the negative propagating solution looks like this, e to the j omega t plus beta z. So um, for a one-dimensional scalar wave equation, you have forward propagating and backward propagating solutions. Now sometimes um, it's convenient to simply work with just the imaginary part, for instance, of the forward propagating solution. So we can work just with um, a function that looks like this, e equals a, some amplitude a, times sine of omega t minus beta z, again, the, the negative sign here, denoting that um, the wave is propagating in the plus z direction, okay? 
Omega again is the frequency in radians per second and beta again is the wave number in radians per meter. All right. The wave is sinusoidal if we fix time and look at the wave as a function of position. All right, let's see what I mean by that. I'm looking at figure one here. Okay, so here's figure 1a. What's happened here is we've chosen a particular time. So we've, we set time to be equal to a constant and we're looking at the wave as a function of, of z, as a function of position, all right? <clears throat> we can also, we can also fix the position and allow time to run. That's what you're seeing here in the second picture. Um, you, if you'll notice, um, uh, for the first one here where we fixed time and, and allowed the uh, wave to vary with space, we've got a, a number of important quantities here to define. Um, the wavelength is simply um, the distance that it takes for the, uh, the, for the wave to start to repeat itself. Okay, so lambda is a, is a, is a distance. And then here you're seeing also the amplitude uh, of the wave. Um, the, the analogous quantity when instead we fix the position, so choose a particular z value and then allow time to run, is called the period capital T, and that is simply the time that it takes um, for the wave to begin to uh, repeat itself. So these 1D solutions to um, the uh, one-dimensional scalar wave equation are sinusoidal both in space and in time. <clears throat> okay, um, we can we can make some uh, we can make some draw some conclusions here uh, based on the definitions of the wavelength lambda and the period t. Since it takes time capital T for the wave to travel a distance lambda, the velocity of the wave um, is related to the wavelength and the period in this way. We say that the wavelength is equal to the wave velocity times the period. Distance equals rate times time. Um, it turns out also you can show that the period is simply the reciprocal of the frequency, where f is the frequency in hertz. And so we can rewrite this equation as um, the velocity is equal to, the velocity of the wave is equal to the frequency times its wavelength. So very important equation in wave physics right there. The wave number beta um, is related to the wavelength in this way, so beta is two pi over lambda. Now let's have a look down here at figure two. Okay, What you're seeing here in figure two is again this solution to the scalar wave equation that we, we've been working with um, at various times. So again, um, I mentioned before that one of the things we can do is fix time and look at how the wave behaves as a function of space. That's what you're seeing here um, for time equals zero uh, in uh, figure 2a, what you're the, then you're seeing the wave at time equals uh, t over 4, figure 2b, and at time equals t over 2, figure 2c. We'll return to this picture momentarily. Okay. <clears throat> well, one of the things we would like to do is determine the velocity of the wave. How, how are we going to define um, the velocity of the wave? Well, let's go back and look at the figure here again. Um, the velocity of the wave is um, the speed of a point of constant phase. So what they've done here is they've labeled um, this point here at the crest of the wave as P. And you're seeing P is located right here at time zero. Then it's located over here at time uh, t by 4, and it's located over here at time t over 2. So um, this point is moving to the right at a particular velocity. That's, that, that speed is considered the um, speed of the wave. So the entire wave is just shifting to the right as time progresses. Okay. 
Um, so what we'd like to know is we want to track the velocity of a point of constant phase, P. Constant phase, in this case, means that the argument of that sine wave, omega t minus beta z, is equal to some constant, all right? Um, so, so if that's true, if, if we're interested in, in a point of constant phase, then we can solve this equation for z, and we can look at the position as a function of time now. And if we solve this equation for z, we get omega t over beta minus c over beta. The velocity is um, the uh, derivative of the position with respect to time. And uh, that clearly, according to this equation, is just equal to omega divided by beta. So um, <coughs> for waves of this form, the wave, the wave speed is simply um, omega divided by beta. That gets you uh, an equation for the velocity of the wave. So this point right here, P, is moving at a speed ome omega divided by beta in the positive z direction. All right, well, now let's begin our discussion of specifically electromagnetic waves. As I said, there are many different waves that obey wave equations out there. But of particular interest to us are electromagnetic waves. It turns out that Maxwell's equations have wave-like solutions. How are we going to see that? Um, let's look first at the time harmonic version of, of Maxwell's equations in a source-free lossy medium. Again now, um, this sub s is our notation for a phasor. So we've assumed an e to the j omega t time dependence here for all of these fields. Plug that, um, that solution into Maxwell's equations and this is what comes out. So we have our two curl equations and our two divergence equations in frequency domain, all right? Let's take the curl of the first curl equation, which is Faraday's law. So we're going to take the curl of the left and the right-hand sides here. Um, that leads to this equation. And then we're going to substitute for this curl term right here, the curl of the electric field from Ampere's law. We know that the curl of the electric field is equal to this. So we can substitute for the curl here from Ampere's law. And the right-hand side of this equation then becomes minus j omega mu times sigma plus j omega epsilon times the electric field. So by doing that, we've eliminated the magnetic field here from equation 9. What are the consequences of that? Well, next thing we're going to do is we're going to apply this vector identity to the left-hand side of equation 9. When we do that, the left-hand side of 10, I should say, but looks like this now. The gradient of the divergence term minus the vector Laplacian here is equal to the original right-hand side. We know that um, based on Gauss's law in a source-free region, this the divergence of the electric field is equal to zero, so long as there is no um, electric charge density there in the region. The right-hand side um, can be set equal to zero. And so this term is, in fact, equal to zero in a source-free region. So we're going to set that equal to zero. And then equation 12 becomes this equation. So we've got <coughs> the vector Laplacian of the, of the electric field is equal to j omega mu sigma plus j omega, e j omega epsilon times the electric field. So um, we can rewrite that equation in this way. <coughs> the vector Laplacian of E minus gamma squared um, E is equal to 0. This is, in fact, um, a wave equation right here. It doesn't look too different in one sense from the scalar wave equation. You have a second derivative term here with respect to the spatial variable minus the square of some constant times the field. It's pretty similar to the time harmonic um, 1D scalar equation that we saw before. However, this is a vector equation. This is a vector Laplacian. And the vector Laplacian looks different in Cartesian cylindrical and spherical coordinates. So it's different in all three. So you need to look up the vector Laplacian um, in the coordinate system that you are working in before you actually apply it. Okay. 
And <clears throat> this wave number beta, this is a, the complex wave number, excuse me, gamma. This, this is the complex wave number gamma right here. And it clearly is going to have real and imaginary parts. If gamma squared is equal to j omega mu sigma plus j omega epsilon, <clears throat> if I take the square root of both sides of this thing, it stands to reason that there is going to be <clears throat> a real and an imaginary part here. Um, it, it can be shown quite easily by doing the analogous um, uh, similar steps that the um, magnetic field also obeys a vector um, Helmholtz equation. That's really identical to the electric field. Okay, So both the, the conclusion there is that both the electric field and the magnetic field satisfy wave equations in general um, when you're talking about elect the electrodynamic Mac Maxwell's equations. So both of these, um, we can expect the electric field and the magnetic field to um, behave like waves. That's one of the big, big takeaways of this lecture. OK, now <clears throat> the vector Laplacian in Cartesian coordinates implies that equation 14, this guy, can be written in this fashion. So um, as long as we're in Cartesian coordinates, this um, this equation here actually implies three different equations. One that governs the x component of the electric field, one that com governs the y component, and one that governs the z component. Okay. Okay. Well, let's specify, let's suppose now that, suppose that the electric field only has an x component and, and further suppose that that x component only depends on position z. All right. Then what we can do is we can just work with this top equation right here, the first of the three. All right. And um, since this uh, e sub sx component only depends on z, the partials with respect to x and y are equal to 0. And this equation simply may be rewritten in this way. The partial with respect to z can be written now as an ordinary derivative because um, the x component only depends on, on z. Right? And again, this, uh, this little equation here is a scalar wave equation that has um, two solutions. Um, one that depends on e to the minus gamma z and one that depends on e to the plus gamma z. Well, if we require the field to be finite at z equals infinity, then we have to disallow this particular term here that, go, that um, uh, it depends on e to the plus um, gamma z because <clears throat> the real part of gamma is positive. And uh, so this, will, uh, this term will, will blow up as z tends to infinity. So we're going to um, set that term equal to 0. And we're just going to work with this first term that's finite at z equals infinity. All right. Um, if we just restrict ourselves to that first term, we can recover the time domain solution from the frequency d domain solution by simply taking the real part of um, <coughs> our uh, frequency domain solution here times e to the j omega t. All right. So that's the real part here of e naught times e to the minus alpha z times e to the j omega t minus beta z. And that um, looks like this when you actually take the real part of it. It's e to the minus alpha z times cosine of omega t minus beta z um, x hat. So in time domain, in time domain, what you have is you have a field uh, that oscillates. You have a wave that oscillates. This is the oscillatory term that's responsible to, for the oscillations. And you have a um, term that uh, <coughs> decays. Um, let's look down here at, at figure three. So this is um, an E field with an X component that travels in the plus Z direction to the right. Um, and it's showing you the field at times t equals 0 right here, the solid line. 
and at times t equals delta t, all right? So again, <clears throat> the wave, this wave still propagates, it still travels, why? Because this, this point of constant phase is going to move to the right as time increases. However, this wave, the amplitude as a function of position also decays, right? So if we freeze time, we expect that the amplitude of the wave should decay as e to the minus alpha z. And that is in fact what you observe, right? So right here, if you just look at time equals delta, uh, time equals t equals zero, right here, um, <clears throat> the envelope of the wave looks something like that. It's decaying, right? The amplitude decays as z increases. And the same thing happens here at t equals zero. The amplitude of the wave decreases as a function of position z, okay? Okay, now <clears throat> let's substitute um, e naught e to the minus gamma z into Faraday's law, okay? So we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna go back to frequency domain for a moment here and we're gonna substitute this solution for um, ES into Faraday's law and solve for the magnetic field, all right? So we're gonna take this solution and we're gonna plug it into this equation right here, okay? We're gonna take that solution that we found for the electric field and frequency domain and we're gonna, we're gonna plug it into this equation. We're gonna take the curl of it and then we're gonna solve for the electric field that results excuse me, solve for the magnetic field. When you do that, it turns out that the magnetic field is pretty closely related in one sense to the electric field. It's just simply equal to the amplitude of the electric, electric field divided by a term eta that's called the intrinsic impedance times e to the minus gamma zt in the y hat direction. So it's at 90 degrees to um, the, the um, electric field. The intrinsic impedance gamma is given by this little equation. It's the square root of j omega mu divided by sigma plus j omega epsilon. So to close, let's look at one um, special case here. Let's look at the case where um, we're in free space. So let's just assume that this wave is, is now propagating in, in free space. What that means is that sigma is equal to zero. The permittivity is equal to the permittivity of uh, free space and the permeability is equal to the permeability of free space, okay? When you make those substitutions back in, um, again, looking at the wave in frequency domain, the electric field looks like this. It's equal to <coughs> the amplitude times again, cosine omega t minus beta z. Because we're here in, um, <clears throat> because we are in a lossless medium, you're just gonna have oscillation here. You're not gonna have any decay as um, Z increases as a function of Z. So this is what the frequency domain electric field looks like um, for this particular situation in free space. And then we have the frequency domain magnetic field, which looks, just get this up a little higher here, which looks like this, okay? <laughs> where eta naught here, again, again, it's pointing, it's, the magnetic field is polarized along the y direction, and the intrinsic impedance of free space is just the square root of the permeability of free space divided by the permittivity of free space, which is 100 pi, 120 pi, excuse me, which is approximately 377 ohms. So this intrinsic impedance does have units of, of ohms, all right? It literally is an impedance, okay? All right, now, solutions of this type are very important. They're called uniform plane waves, all right? Why are they called uniform plane waves? They're called uniform plane waves because they have the same magnitude along any plane defined, defined by z equals a constant. Let's see if we can see um, mathematically how that how that might work okay <clears throat> if you'll notice if you'll notice if for instance here for the magnetic field if we set um, z equals to, to some constant here um, you'll notice that if we if we were to look at the the magnitude of, of this of this y component here of the magnetic field 
um, you'll notice it is not a function of x or y. So at any point in an x in an x y plane, in a plane parallel to to the x y plane, I should say, the magnitude of the of the magnetic field is constant. The same argument can be made here for the electric field. The magnitude of this function does not depend on x or y. So in any plane parallel to the xy plane at a particular value of z, the, mag the magnitude um, of this particular uh, electric field is, is, is the same. <clears throat> Let's have a look at this last figure here. Um, what you're seeing in figure four is a plot um, of the electric and magnetic fields here as a function of position at, per, at times t, at a particular time, in this case, time t equal, uh, equals to zero. All right. Um, and at a particular location for part B, uh, at z equals zero. All right. The arrows indicate instantaneous values. So again, um, remember at the uh, we we've seen pictures of the electric field if you fix the time and allow space to vary. That's that envelope, right, like that. And again, if you were to move anywhere in the y direction or in the x direction at a particular z location, the magnitude of that field is going to be the same. So you have a gigantic plane of constant amplitude that's at 90 degrees to the direction of, of propagation here, all right? Um, and then if you'll notice, the magnetic field is at 90 degrees everywhere, at 90 degrees to the electric field. That's also characteristic of plane waves. If you take the electric field and you cross it into the magnetic field, you get the direction of propagation, which in this case is the z direction. Okay. Now, um, if you look at uh, part b of figure four here, um, what you're seeing is the fact that the electric field is in fact um, linearly polarized. We mentioned that um, a plane wave is going to be linearly polarized if the electric field only has one component, which is the case here. It only points along the x direction. So you have linear polarization for the, um, for the electric field in this case. And similarly, the magnetic field also only has one component. and so it only moves along a line like that along the y-axis. All right, that concludes our discussion of electromagnetic waves for today. Thank you for your attention. See you in the next lecture.